I join my colleague, Justice Sanjay Kishan Kaul, and all other colleagues in welcoming Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon. I know that all of you are eagerly awaiting to hear Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon's lecture, and so am I. We have gathered today to commemorate the 73rd anniversary of the establishment of the Supreme Court of India. The Supreme Court came into being on 28 January 1950, two days after India adopted its constitution and became an independent sovereign republic. From this year, we will be commemorating the first sitting of the Supreme Court each year by organizing the Supreme Court of India annual lecture. It is an honor to have Chief Justice Menon deliver the first annual lecture on the theme, the role of the judiciary in a changing world. We have, as our distinguished guest today, a jurist extraordinary. He has the unique distinction of having served as both the Attorney General and now as the Chief Justice of Singapore. He is truly in the tradition of scholar judges. Just yesterday, he presented to me one of the first few copies of his book titled Transnational Commercial Disputes in an Age of Anti-Globalism and Pandemic, which he has co-authored with a distinguished scholar, Anselmo Reyes. So we couldn't have had a better speaker, judge, and scholar than to begin this lecture series this morning. The Federal Court created under the Government of India Act 1935 was the predecessor to the Supreme Court. But its jurisdiction was limited to adjudicating disputes between provinces and federal states and hearing appeals against the High Court decisions. In contrast, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction not only extends to hearing criminal and civil appeals, but also extends to the enforcement of fundamental rights and disputes involving the states of the Indian Federation. In addition, our court can advise the president on important questions of law. The Constitution has envisaged a unified and integrated judiciary with the Supreme Court of India at its apex. The Supreme Court serves the world's most populous democracy and is in true aspects a people's court because it's a collective heritage of the people of India. The Supreme Court's opening session was held on 28 January 1950 in the Chamber of Princes in the Parliament Building, where the Federal Court sat for several years. The inaugural proceedings were marked by an air of solemnity and simplicity. At its inception, the Court had a sanctioned strength of eight judges, but the court started functioning with an occupied strength of six judges. During the inaugural session, all six judges of the Supreme Court, including Chief Justice Harilal Kaniya, took their seats on the dais. In attendance were the Chief Justices of the High Courts, the Prime Minister, other ministers, ambassadors, and diplomatic representatives of foreign states, a large number of senior and other advocates of the court, and other distinguished visitors graced the occasion. In his address, Chief Justice Kaniya prophesied that the court will play a great part in the building up of the nation. Chief Justice Kaniya's words were prescient. He said, and I quote him, India has chosen to have a written constitution and the duty of interpreting that constitution with an enlightened liberality falls on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will declare and interpret the law of the land, and with the high traditions behind the judiciary of this country, we are convinced that the work will be done in no, in no spirit of formal or barren legalism. It will be our endeavor to interpret the constitution not as a rigid body, but as a, level, lev as a living organization, having within itself the force and power of self-government. Those were the words which have animated successive generations of judges, including so many distinguished amongst them who are present with us 
today. In its first year itself, the Supreme Court heard a number of cases related to matters of fundamental rights, including the freedom of speech and equality. As the court began its functioning, several doyens of Indian constitutional law and many members of the Constituent Assembly appeared before the court. The chairperson of the drafting committee of the Constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, also appeared before the Supreme Court in 1952 in the celebrated state of Bihar versus Sri Kameshwar Singh. Ever since the Constitution was enacted, the Supreme Court has sat in Delhi. A lesser known fact is that the Supreme Court has functioned outside Delhi on two occasions. That is in Hyderabad in 1950 and in Kashmir in 1954. On the coming into force of the Constitution, all appeals of Privy Councils in Hyderabad and Kashmir were transferred to the Supreme Court. The appeal records of these courts were in local languages and their translations would have entailed much expense and time. A far cry from AI-assisted machine translations today. Therefore, the Chief Justice decided to constitute a bench in Hyderabad and Kashmir to hear and decide the pending appeals. In 1954, a decision was taken to construct a separate building for the Supreme Court. The Chief Architect, Ganesh Bikaji Devralikar designed the building in the shape of a balance with a pair of scales of justice. When you enter the court premises, you will find the pensive statue of Mahatma Gandhi facing the court building. The court's logo consists of the wheel of dharma with the inscription, Yato Dharmastato Jayaha, meaning where there is dharma, there is victory. These are not merely ornamental imageries. They represent the values of the Constitution and the aspirations of our people. They serve as a reminder for both judges as well as lawyers to act righteously. The present Supreme Court complex was inaugurated by Dr. Rajendra Prasad on 4 August 1958. At the inauguration, Chief Justice S.R. Das presciently laid forth the responsibility of the court when he said, to us, the new building stands forth as a solemn and sublime symbol of the majesty of the law. The portals of this palace of justice shall be open to every person who may seek redress for wrong, if any done to them, by their fellow citizens or by the state, and justice will be denied to none. The lowliest of the law, be he a citizen or a non-citizen, may as of right claim here equality before the law and shall receive from this temple of justice equal protection of the laws. Later on, in July 2019, the additional building complex of the Supreme Court, where we are today celebrating this event, uh, was inaugurated. The court's workload during the initial years was a fraction of what we witness today. In the annual report of 2005-2006, one of our former distinguished judges who is present here, Justice B.P. Singh, recounts that when he visited the Supreme Court for the first time in 1956, the proceedings were solemn and virtually dull. He also observed that at a time only five to six lawyers would be present in the court hall. Over the years, the workload of the Supreme Court has increased. Every day now, the Supreme Court has hundreds of cases on its docket. The judges of the Supreme Court and the staff of the registry put up tremendous work to ensure the speedy disposal of cases. Just to give you a simple sampling, in the last three months, 12,108 cases were filed before the Supreme Court. 12,471 cases have been disposed of. We have to also remember, we have to also remember that the functioning of the Supreme Court was very different from the provincial high courts as they then existed. Many judges who are serving in the provincial high courts found it difficult to get accustomed to the new ways. When Justice Muhammad Hidayatullah was elevated to the Supreme Court in 1958, Mondays were miscellaneous days. Justice Hidayatullah's first day in court was a Monday. Late Sunday night, he found a huge bundle of 35 specially petitions by his bedside. He was expected to have read them by the morning. However, Justice Vivian Bose, with whom Justice Hidayatullah was staying at the time, advised him to read only the later cases because most of his colleagues would have only read the earlier cases 
and that way he could control the conversation in the courtroom. Like Justice Hidayatullah, we the bar and the bench are also learning and adapting to the new norms on a daily basis. Over the years, the sanction strength of the court was increased and currently it stands at 34 judges. As the number of cases increased, the court started sitting in smaller benches of two, three and five, of, and five judges. The Supreme Court's jurisprudential approach has been evolving. In the 1970s, the court adopted a broad, purposive and contextual interpretation of the Constitution. In the past few years, the court has furthered the transformative vision of the Constitution by recognizing and protecting fundamental rights such as the right to privacy, decisional autonomy, and sexual and reproductive choices. Our court has emerged as a strong proponent of gender equality, whether it be in its interpretation of the laws of inheritance or securing the entry of women in the armed forces. The court has also ensured that the criminal justice administration is not delinked from the framework of human rights. For instance, while the death penalty has been upheld to be legal and constitutional, the Supreme Court laid down various mitigating and aggravating circumstances that a judge should take into account before awarding the sentence of death. This ensures fairness in the process. Procedural innovations, open court hearings in the views arising out of death penalty cases, or psychiatric assessment of death row convicts have a humanizing influence on the law. Thus, the court has sought to use the language of the Constitution to humanize law and act as a protector and defender of fundamental rights and liberties. In the past few decades, India's legal landscape has undergone significant changes with the adoption of legislation such as the Competition Law and the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. Consequently, commercial matters now comprise a significant part of the daily docket along with criminal matters. While dealing with such cases, the court has often drawn upon the new and emerging jurisprudence developed in other jurisdictions. To give you just one example, in dealing with the insolvency and bankruptcy matters, the court has often referred to principles enunciated by the Singapore courts because of a similarity in legislation. I did so in my decision in EBIC Singapore Private Limit versus Educom Solutions. In arbitration cases, the court has taken a conscious stand of upholding the sanctity of contracts. The Supreme Court has made a constant endeavor to ensure access to justice for everyone. The court has facilitated increased access to justice by diluting the requirement of local standi through public interest litigation in the 1980s, by which anyone can approach the constitutional courts in India to seek a redressal of a violation of their fundamental rights. By doing so, the court opened its door to persons bereft of the means to approach the court because of their social and economic disadvantage. This has provided a space for citizens to converse with the state on equal terms. In turn, the court has been using its jurisdiction to make the rule of law a daily reality for persons belonging to the marginalized communities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the Supreme Court adopted innovative technological solutions to reach out to the people by adopting video conferencing of court proceedings. During the period between 23rd March 2020 and 31st October 2022, the Supreme Court alone heard 3.37 lakh cases through video conferencing. We updated our video conferencing infrastructure in courtrooms at a meta scale. And we are continuing to use such technological infrastructure to allow a hybrid mode of court hearings that allows parties to join court proceedings from any part of the world online. In the recent budget, the government of India has announced a provision of rupees 7,000 crores for phase three of the e-courts project. This will help to enhance the accessibility of judicial institutions and improve the efficiency of the justice delivery system in India. Such endeavors will ensure that the court truly reaches out to every citizen of our country. If we peruse the history of this court, we realize that the history of the Supreme Court is a history of the daily life struggles of the Indian people. The mentioning list every morning in the court of the Chief Justice of India 
spans anywhere between 60 to 100 cases. Through these seemingly innocuous requests, we can sense the pulse of the nation. Above all, we sent a message in this uniquely citizen-centric initiative, and that message is of an assurance that this court exists to protect our citizens from injustice. Their liberties are as precious to us as to them, and that the judges work in close connect with our communities. In conclusion then, let me say that there should be three principles which should guide our approach, and I borrow something from what has been delivered by the greats of the past who have decided cases before us. First is that we must apply the precautionary principle in the work which we do. Second, we as judges must apply the principle of sustainable development because it is the principle of sustainable development which will ensure that the institutions which have been created to us will be safe and sound when we as pilgrims in this path hand over the baton to our successors. And third, we must always remember the public trust doctrine because we hold this institution in trust for the future. So if we apply these three principles, the precautionary principle, the principle of sustainable development, and the public trust doctrine, not just in the context of environmental litigation, but each day of our lives, we will ensure that our court remains vibrant despite climate change. For the court, there are no big or small cases. Every matter is important because it is in the seemingly small and routine matters involving the grievances of citizens that issues of constitutional and jurisprudential importance emerge. In attending to such grievances, the court performs a plain constitutional duty, a plain constitutional obligation, and a plain constitutional function. Uh, before I conclude, I thank uh, Chief Justice Sundaresh Menon from the bottom of my heart for <laughs> unveiling this lecture series. As I said, we couldn't have had uh, a more distinguished jurist across the world than him to deliver this inaugural lecture. Thank you, Namaskar.